x, let's call it x of a, and y of a. These are both n-dimensional vectors, and the point is that in 2n. Many coordinates are zero, so the actual positive entry may be 6 on one side and 3 on the other. Right? But that's what it is. Now, by the way, as you notice, von Neumann assumes that the output vector is always a vector. Now, in part, this is just empty mathematical generality. In part is that obviously the single output activity is a useful sometime analytical device, but it's seldom the case. Are you following me? So in particular, in an integrated descriptive system like the one he built, the output of an activity includes all the inputs that are durable and survive to the production process without being destroyed. So if the activity is boiling three eggs, the inputs are the gas, the time of the cook, the pot, the water, the raw eggs, and what else? The match, if you need to buy on the gas, or the electric <laughs> zippy. Uh, I think I listed it all, okay? And among the output, there is the boiled eggs that did not exist before because before there were the raw eggs. There is the warm water that you probably throw away or throw on the head of the neighbor if he's bothering you. <laughs> I'm making noise. Uh, the gas is gone, I'm afraid, so is the match. But the pot is there. It's a dirty pot, but it's still useful. So there's always some joint production. In, uh, in a production process. Now, so that's an activity. I want you to notice one thing, that by definition, an activity is a fixed coefficient production function, as we call it. In fact, our way of calling it is input-output. It's just that in input-output formulation a la Leontief, we make a restrictive assumption, which is that there is just one output. How do you write an input-output production function? You write output y equal mean right, of a, 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 a string, you know, a1, sorry, alpha 1 x1, alpha 2 x2, alpha n xn, right? Right? That's our way of writing an input-output technology. So this is R1 and this is Rn. Right? You guys all with me? Follow me? Sure? Stop. I see eyes going. Some eyes are already in Shanghai. <laughs> Others are thinking about dinner tonight. One is thinking about boyfriend, girlfriend. And one is thinking, hmm, what is he doing with that small chalk? So, those eyes should come back here with me and stay in company. Is that clear, what I wrote? I don't give you the grade. If you want, we kick him out, so he doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask the question if you don't follow. Okay, so that's an activity. The thing I want to make you notice, first of all, is that the unit of analysis is a fixed coefficient thing. In fact, here is one thing I want to teach you. Isoquants do not exist in anybody that's in, the, in a fixed technology. Smooth isoquants. Smooth isoquants are the product of technological change. And one of the worst mistakes, well, mistakes, one of the worst simplification of modern macroeconomics is to have forgotten where isoquants or production function come from. And having thought that a given isoquant amounts to a given technology, that's not true. Moving along the isoquant, as I, I will show you in a moment, means changing technology. Because any technology anywhere allows for extremely little substitutability. Now, true, 
maybe this is an exaggeration. Maybe the more or less you get the same output by doing, well, I can't because this is the output. You know, by, by maybe this is not just the point, you know, you hold that fixed and there is in the dimensional space there is a little, little surface, little combination of the axis that, that gives you. But not a lot, not a lot, not a lot. Think of my example of boiling three eggs. If you have to boil three eggs, you better start with three eggs. Right? Then you can change the other things a bit, but not a lot. If you have to dry things around, it's very hard to replace trucks with drivers. Whenever I hear people doing capital labor substitution for given technology, I go, yeah. So drivers cost more, we put a truck to drive a truck, right? Or maybe we put half a driver and half a truck to drive another truck. Or something like that. It, you know, for a given technology, substitutability of a factor with another is always extremely limited. You can do it, but it's example by example, you will find it extremely limited. Our, for example, is a very fixed coefficient technology. No way, in fact, we need you, <laughs> you need me, for good or for bad. We may maybe replace some time with a different size of the green board, in this case, blackboard. And, and a few other things, but the basic inputs are very rigid. This is true for most economic activities, most economic activities. That's another thing I think that the literature post 60s and 70s missed completely. Uh, and, and then took the research in growth theory and also in macro off of a very confusing path in which we have, by using a, 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 an extreme simplification that is didactically, pedagogically quite useful. And it's probably also very useful to do national income accounting on the aggregate level. But it tends to cloud to make the situation foggy at an analytical level and make you not see obvious things. So that's a technology. So, uh, I have Please. A so the way how you define this from x to y, so suppose now we double uh, all those x Right. And then we get some output. Then some amount of output. And that is defined as an, another technology, right? It's so not. Another, another activity or... No, it's not. I was exactly going there, so thanks. There is an argument here, which is known as the replication argument. And it's crucial to understand how it works. You know, it's a theoretical thing. Think of our eggs example. Our eggs example says that I can provide you with a technology to boil three eggs, right? In fact, if you think of it, I can provide you with many technologies to boil three eggs. For example, here is another one. Instead of taking the appropriate size pot and the appropriate amount of water, you can take a much bigger pot, put seven eggs in it, three guys, five fires, make a mess, waste a lot of things, then throw away four eggs and keep three. It's dominated, but it uses free disposal. It's sort of certainly another technology. So there's a lot of technologies, most of them completely stupid in the sense of economically inefficient to produce things. That's one thing that we can see if you do that, and you allow me here, to notice that for given x input, this is the efficient one, but all these are also technologies. Instead of producing y, they produce less than y. Vice versa, for given y, oops, all these are also technologies, they just waste input. Okay? All right. So let's focus on the materially efficient one, that one. All right? Materially efficient means that given that technology, if you reduce any of the input along any of the n dimension, you will not get that output. Okay? 
So that's a, we can make this a mathematically precise definition. Given the output level to be reached, any vector of input with some entry strictly lower than the one described here will not yield that vector of output. All right? Then there is a replication argument, which is a logical argument. If I can boil the three eggs in that form, then I can boil six eggs by doing the same thing in parallel. I can boil nine, I can boil twelve, or I can boil one and a half or one to the extent that here I am assuming I'm doing something tricky, which is a crucial assumption we use continuously, and we have decided to live with it in economics, which is we treat objects and things and humans as if they're real numbers and not integers. We have decided to bypass completely in most economic analysis, micro, macro, whatever, <laughs> statistics. We have decided to bypass completely the issue of integer numbers. Some colleagues, some teachers of the past have spent their life trying to solve it. Herbert Scarf who unfortunately did not get the prize he deserved, spent a life unsuccessful. I mean, interesting but unsuccessful for, 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 for decades. Uh, trying to redo a number of analytical things with integer, it's extremely difficult. And it's unclear if we would gain insights that we don't gain otherwise, so we have basically decided to convexify. Okay? Yeah. Convexify means there's no two eggs, three eggs, four eggs, there's also 2.379 eggs, okay? Uh, well, you see, what the replication argument says, says that from a theoretical point of view, if A is an activity, then lambda A is also an activity. Hence, if an activity is a point, more properly it defines a segment. Pointed at the origin, we don't allow for negative inputs and negative output, and going Right? So this is, if this is A, this is lambda A. We call it array from the origin. Mm -hmm. You will hear people in the old literature to talk about von Neumann ray. They mean exactly something like that. That's what a von Neumann ray is. It's a particular activity multiplied by, num by lambda for all values of lambda between zero and infinity. For all positive real lambda. Okay? Is that, is that clear? It simply says you can carry out production at any of these levels. Once the technology is available, it's a replication thing. Obviously, the replication requires accumulation, so it makes you understand accumulation. At any given point in time, in a, def, in a specific country, there will be given physical quantities of inputs, and that will determine where you are, right? You may be here, maybe there. But some, one of the inputs will be in a finite amount. I mean, all the inputs will be in finite amount, and moreover, one of them, given, notice that the inputs are in fixed proportion, right? So one of them will be the one determining the maximum level of production at, 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 at this period. You following me? Yes. Right? I may have four pots, of the appropriate type, all the water I want, and all the eggs I want. But if I only have two fires, I can carry out that production activity in that unit of time at the level two. All the other inputs are redundant, are too abundant. They have to be either used in other activities or left idle. Often, the problem of unemployment has to do with that. People don't, uh, you know, this is a grossly underestimated thing. Often the problem of unemployment has to do with the fact that complementary factors are just not available and are hard to produce. It takes time. Whereas other factors are very abundant. But they're just so abundant that they're not needed. So yes, substitutability helps a bit. You can get redundant, but there is no point in getting too redundant. An airline has no reason to hire more flight personnel than needed just to have redundancy because even if they cost extremely little, they're just going to be inefficient to have around, literally to have around, particularly if you put them on board. 
<laughs> they occupy space. Okay? Uh, so this is something that comes very clear by thinking at, at activity analysis in this form. So the first assumption we'll make here is this. Uh, replication. The replication thing is very important because it has the theory of growth with constant technology built into it. For Neumann correctly points out very quickly, the case it was a very abstract theorist, very sharp, he didn't spend many words. Okay, he lets you think carefully about each word and its implication. If all goods are reproducible, if all goods are reproducible, then what? Assume all goods are reproducible and we have just one activity. Oh, come on, make me happy, say something. Not only, well, I well, get because there's growth, right? All you have to do is to grow along the rate. See, they all got crazy about AK model in the 90s. They were rediscovering von Neumann with about 60 years delay, as some of us had pointed out. As, you know, it's all in von Neumann. No reason to write a paper. Well, many reasons to read the paper. Sometimes studying is more useful for humanity than writing. Okay? So the reproducibility is essential. Why? Because, in particular, we can see immediately from this simple starting point, it's not even the full model, but we can see using our intuition where accumulation may stop. Accumulation may stop if one of the factors that are here essential, one of the x's, that are in positive quantity, is available in a fixed amount and cannot be increased. So let's talk about so replication means replicating an activity at a different level. Let's talk about reproducibility and lack of reproducibility to distinguish those factors of production that can be produced and increased in quantity over time and those that cannot or maybe can, but the length of time that it takes for that activity to produce those goods is orders of magnitude the length of time we are considering studying analytically hence we take those factors as given right we understand that there is a sense in which from a very long geological point of view we may increase the natural resources on earth or vary their amount but it's irrelevant to our current thinking because the orders of magnitude of one process and the orders of magnitude of the process we care about are just incommensurable on a more mundane scale, we understand that there is a unit of time along which we can accumulate human capital of high quality. We're just carrying out that activity. But we also understand that if we're looking at the production process of China or United States or France in the next few years, the amount of human capital, the stock of human capital is pretty much given because it takes 25 years to make a new engineer. Right? So if I'm thinking at the number of engineers I have available this month, next month, next semester, the next two, three years in the companies, pretty much it's given, short of importing them. All right? So that's, you know, the time scale here is, is quite relevant. So the point is that if all factors are reproducible, Then, replication argument gives you accumulation and growth. Why? Because activities are constant return to scale by definition. So you see, one thing that I believe is important, I owe this to John Hicks and, and to my advisor, Lionel McKenzie. Lionel pointed out correctly, he says, from a theoretical point of view, technologies are constant return to scale by definition. It's not an assumption. 
It's a logical implication of a properly specified technology. If you go to an engineer and ask the engineer to please describe a technology to you, he will give you this. Very long, detailed list of this. Some of these will be minutes, other will be you know, the specification of movements, but they will be specified inputs. And that is representable like that, and that's constant return to scale. If it is not constant return to scale, it's because you truncate it at a certain point because some factor are in fixed supply. But that doesn't eliminate the constant return to scale. That simply truncates the line. From this point of view, increasing returns do not exist for a given technology. And decreasing returns do not exist for a given technology either. Both are due to aggregation factors.